All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is Zach Moonshine with Metal Devastation Radio. Right now on the phone with me, I have Simon from Vestal Claret. How you doing today, man? I'm all right, man. I'm all right. Thanks for asking. <laughs> so uh, first question I got to ask you is uh, how did this band get started and how long has it been going? And uh, basically, what's all right, this? Well, uh, well, in uh, I think it was about maybe 2006. Uh, I, you know, I run a recording studio, and uh, Mr. Phil Swanson was in uh, was in a studio with his band Upper the End Time, mm-hmm. and uh, he he just approached me, and he he had this idea of doing this uh, side project, and he wanted to know if I'd be interested. And he had two songs that he had in his head. You know, Phil doesn't doesn't play any instruments, but he had some riffs that he was able to sing to me, and I transposed them and filled in some gaps, arranged songs, and uh, we were off. We recorded the Two Stones, and uh, that got released uh, on a split with Eleni and Kodiaks uh, in Germany on Metal Coven Records. Uh, but that's uh, when we started. It was a, it was a rocky beginning, and we did, the, we did those two songs, and we were off at a full length which we composed um but that that didn't get released and that's uh that was at that point Phil had those lyrics he wanted to get them published and so he took them to uh he took them to Chad of Hour 13 and they and they made their first record so if anybody knows us and has heard those two recordings you know Hour 13 first recording and uh our first recording which wasn't released till uh to you know a couple of years ago the the lyrics are the same, <laughs> different music, same lyrics. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you uh, was about the connection between this and uh, Hour of Thirteen. Yeah, it was uh, it was a, a big mistake on my part because uh, when we went to compose the the full length, I got more involved in writing in it, and uh, you know I said to Phil, I want to do more. I want to I want to make it more progressive. Uh, work on better beginnings, better endings, uh, so on and so forth. And he was cool about it. Uh, but when, when the, uh, the demos got rejected, you know, he did what he had to do. He had the, these great lyrics and he had a great chance with our 13. Um, and you know, he made, he made that shift and got that music published and it was heard by, you know, many people. Yeah. And, it, yeah. That, and uh, you know, he released a couple of, uh, couple demos, when we were broken up and those circulated and got the interest piece about the, about finishing the, the, that record. And when he finally came around and said, Hey man, you know, if someone wants to publish this, do you still want to do it? I said, yeah, of course, man. I worked pretty hard on that record and there were some risks on there. Honestly, man, there were some risks on there that I wrote when I was like 15, 16 years old. <laughs> That I never, I never got around to doing because when I was a kid, I just I started late and uh, you know I I just I wasn't good enough to put it bluntly to uh, play play metal. So and I never I never got around to it. I started playing you know uh, pro- progressive music when I when I when I went away to university and it wasn't it wasn't metal and it was pretty it was heavy at parts, but it you know it wasn't your traditional idea of metal <laughs> the way the way we listened to it when we were growing up. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, when uh, when the promoters sent it over to me, the Vestal Claret, and I was listening to it the first time. I didn't, I didn't read about it or anything. I just, I was just listening to it, and that was the first thing I thought was, "Wow, this sounds, this sounds kind of like Hour of Thirteen. Then I started reading. I was like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> same same very, singer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. I, I like it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We, we uh. You know, we work hard as we can <laughs> with everything going on. Because you know, Phil's very involved in his family, and so am I. I've got I've got a lot younger kids than he does, but um, and I got the recording studio. But it's it's a great situation because it's just us two. We fill we fill out the uh, we usually use it. We've used almost the same drummer every time um, when we recorded. Uh, but he's he's a higher gun and. You know, we, we pretty much have creative control over. I have creative control over the music, and Phil, Phil, you know, does what he wants with the with the lyrics and the melodies, which is great. It's a great arrangement. Oh, that's cool. You guys did did a great job with that too, man. The production is just it's extremely organic and really. Uh, I mean, yeah. 
<laughs> you, you don't hear that too often in today's today's heavy metal scene. But I, that's the way I operate. My 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 recording gear doesn't allow me to to quantize or tune vocals or do crazy editing or anything. And I don't I don't track or place the drums. I mean, it is what it is. I'm recording in a basement, so the drums don't sound as well as they would if we were at a you know hundred dollar an hour studio. But right now we we, we got to do the things the way we, we got to do them, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, sometimes sometimes that's how you get a really you know a unique sound too is just uh, by feeding off what's you know where it's at. Yeah, that's my that's my philosophy when I produce. You, you work with what you got. Yeah. You know, don't try to make something that it's not because that's, for me, that's a waste of time. And a lot of other people don't operate that way. But um, when I listen to drums, I, I myself, I want to hear drums. <laughs> yeah. It happens, it happens so far, far few and far between nowadays. Yeah. With some of these modern records, it you can almost forget that the drums are actually made out of wood, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you like it, man. It makes me very happy to hear that. It seems like it's it's being received very well by whoever's reviewing it um, on the interweb. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But there's like a lot of. It's one of those records you can't you can't just get it like the first time. Like you have to you do have to listen to it over and over to find all the different. Because there's every time I listen to it, there's always something different that I'll notice and I'll be like, oh shit, what was that? Yeah, I love I love music that grows on you. I really do, and I'm the same way about movies. I actually I watch more movies than I listen to, listen to music. And if I can watch a movie a hundred times and still enjoy it and still find things about it that I didn't notice before, that's that's real entertainment for me. That's uh, you know, it's something that I I really appreciate and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah, man. <laughs> Well, the name Vestal Claret, how, how did you guys come up with that, and what's that mean to you? Well, uh, that was Phil's idea, and, and his his, uh, his name came before anything. So that's the way he worked with that. I think he does that uh, quite often with the side projects that he starts. Um, he comes up with a name, and then... But it, it, if you look up those two different words, uh, it translates to virgin blood. The claret can also mean a wine, but it also means blood. So, you know, uh, it's, it's, but it sounds cool. It's mysterious. It's, uh, it's definitely catchy in a, in a way you, you say, what's that? And, it, and you, you have to remember what it is. Um, but, uh, it just means virgin blood. It's a euphemism, I guess you could say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But you know, a lot of a lot of the stuff he writes about and sings about uh, is you know sacrifice and snatching snatching people and stuff like sexual torture and stuff like that. So it's uh, it's right along there. <laughs> very cool. Very very cool. Yeah. Now the artwork on the record. Who did that? And and uh, yeah. did okay. you guys come that, up with that or? Yeah. Well, the the concept was actually. Uh, borrowed. <laughs> uh, what had happened, uh, this was a long time ago when Phil was still on Facebook, he posted a, uh, a drawing on loose leaf paper that was taken from a, a court case. So it was, it was a piece of evidence that he was he had access to. So I think all that stuff, you can look it up after a period of time or whatever. But it was from the, um, the West Memphis uh, 3 case. Yeah. Yeah, so Damien Eccles actually drew that on a piece of loose leaf paper, and we, we just changed it a bit. And um, there's uh, there's actually a song about that on the record. Uh, but the, we handed that over. Actually, you know, I said to him, I said, hey, man, that would make a great album cover. What do you think? And he, he says, you know, fuck yeah. Uh, so I showed it to uh, Enrico Cruz Sir, and he's like, yeah, man, that would work. And uh he hooked us up with this guy from Finland. His name's Ju- Juha. I'm probably going to kill his name, but it's, uh, <laughs> spelled, it's spelled Juha Boroma. 
Uh, it's J U H A B U O R M A, and he's a painter out there in Finland. And uh, we showed it to him, and he gave me a couple sketches, and bam, he came, you know, he, he did a great job, and he did it quickly, too. Yeah, you know, that's fucking killer, man. I dig it. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty creepy, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we love we love that. Yeah, we we're pretty psyched about that. And uh you know, Phil was talking about giving uh Damon Eccles credit for the uh concept. I was like, ah, I don't know, man. We can just leave it out, man. It, it's actually uh when you get arrested and they put stuff in evidence, it's public property anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible, but it's not exactly like the way he, he drew it. And it had nothing to do with that either. I think uh, Phil had mentioned because he was he was interviewed and asked that question. I read that, but uh, I guess they used it against him in, in the court. But it, he was actually claiming that it was a it was supposed to be a white magic uh, drawing or some you know silly positive thing. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Right. <laughs> Cool. All right. Well, you guys and you're on Cruise Del Sur Music. How is that going yeah. for you? And how, how do you like those guys so far? Excellent. Yeah. You know, uh, well, it, you know, we got the contract. I read it. It was bare bones, man. There was no gobbledygook in there. He said outright to me, he said, look, I think you guys got a lot of potential. You know, I know a lot of people don't know about you because obviously we don't play live or tour. But he, he, you know, he genuinely likes our music and thinks that he could do do uh, do well by us. But so, um, I think you know, he explained everything. Everything's been on schedule. Everything's great. Uh, he's up forward with everything. He's and he's doing something I never had before. This is the first time we've been signed to somebody who actually hired uh, <laughs> he hired people to spread the word, which is is more more than I can ask for, you know. And, you know, I don't, I'm not I'm not going out there promoting a record. Other people are doing it. That's just excellent. Yeah. But yeah. if you look at you look at his label, man, all his bands are awesome. And you know, he, he moves a couple bands up. Uh, I've seen a couple of uh, bands that he's had that's moved on to bigger labels. I mean, I'm not saying that's going to happen for us, but I mean, what more can a metal band want from a label? Yeah, they're definitely getting it out there, man. That's definitely cool. Yeah. And uh, let me ask you, what are you? What would you say your main influences are as a band, and uh, what got you into metal? <laughs> well, I um, I'm a weirdo because I I tend to not listen to music, so I can be more pure when I write. mm Hmm. Uh, with that being said, that's just having to do with maybe the past uh, 20 years. Uh, when I was a kid, adolescent, I heard um, I heard metal the first time, and immediately I thought to myself, I got to get an instrument. <laughs> it just it, the the vibe from it was so intense, and it, it just went right through me and inspired me to want to do it myself. Um, and those recordings were, you know, uh, peace cells, uh, uh, you know, the first three Metallica records. Yeah. I think I heard them all. I think I heard them all within a couple of weeks of each other. Um, I really liked Fate's warning and, uh, they were also from Connecticut, sort of. I think they moved out to L.A. Uh, I'm not too sure if, if, when they did that. I don't know the history too much, but uh, those those first uh, three Fates Warning records are still my favorite albums to listen to when it comes to metal. Uh, Phil's influenced by... All these, all these, all these obscure bands. <laughs> he knows everything. You can talk to that guy about a band you think he wouldn't <laughs> know about, and he'll know, he'll be like, "Oh yeah, I know those guys." <laughs> I think I, I think of the whole time I've known him, I think I gave him one suggestion that he hadn't heard of, and he's like, "Oh man, this is great. Thanks. I felt really big that day." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really cool, like one of the cool kids. Yeah, but yeah, like I said. Um, a lot of the times when I write, 
I just uh, I try to shut myself off from music, and I usually get inspired just by feelings, vibes, maybe artwork or movies that have a. And I, and I process that stuff, and that's uh, how it comes through me. I've got a I've got a a replica of Conan the Barbarian sword hanging on the wall in my studio, <laughs> and that's, and that's and that's great inspiration to me because that, that's by far one of my favorite movies of all time. Oh fuck yeah, dude! That's yeah. that's got to be one of the most metal movies ever. <laughs> yeah. I saw that way too. I saw that way too young, man. My, I was in a uh, house, and my mom, my mom worked. My, my mom and dad worked together, and I, I live uh, with my mom, my grandma, and we had HBO and the movie channel. And the movie channel used to play R-rated movies all day long, man. And my my grandma used to sit in her room and play cards, and I just I just watched brutal movies. Pretty <laughs> <laughs> good time. Fuck yeah, man. Well. Uh, so how do you feel about the music industry today and like with the internet and everything and how how it's changed? Well, that's a double-edged sword because a lot of bands are able to put their music out there because it's a lot easier. Everybody's got a recording studio. Right. And that allows people to hear some music they would never be able to have access to. Exactly. And and then there's some sometimes you don't want those people to be able to put their <laughs> music on the internet. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's you know, it's it's really put the music back in the musician's hands, so to speak, but I don't think it's any easier for musicians to make money. It's that it's definitely harder for studios to make money. Because everybody and their mother has their own recording studio. So that, you know, I say to them, well, sometimes I talk to people and I say, yeah, I got a studio. They're like, yeah, we got a studio too. And, uh, right. It's like, it's like everybody, anybody and everybody can get out there, but at the same time, they don't have to work so hard to do it. So it might yeah. be, you know, it's not as, I don't know. But then again, you know, Anything can be heard, but like you said, you know, it's it, it's harder to make money off of it because it's just available. Yeah. You now you can watch a video, or you can people are downloading, and you know, just or you can just go on the internet and stream it, which a lot of people do. Yeah, a lot of people download music illegally, like whatever. I used to make copies of cassettes all the time. But you know what? It takes a social aspect out of it, though. Whenever I used to copy cassettes when I was a kid, I would be hanging out with somebody, and they'd say, hey, listen to this, man. You know, today it's... The one thing I miss is people don't have uh, love for packaging anymore. For me, I mean, I can tell you this right now. I, I was listening to that re- our record for a long time before... Uh, you know, it's coming out this week, but uh, I think the official date is Tuesday. I'm, I, can't, I, I get confused. That sometimes I see the second, and sometimes sometimes I see the sixth. But <laughs> I was listening to that record for a long time, and somehow when I, when Enrico sent us the CDs, and I pulled the the, the CD package out, it sounded better. I mean, explain that to me. <laughs> That's just me. I need the cover. I need the the insert. Uh, if I'm listening to a record, I love looking at the artwork. And I think that a lot of the younger folks, it doesn't matter them, to them. I mean, even even on um, you know, I, my father got me a uh, a long time ago. He's like, here, man, you have your own iPod. I'm like, nah, man, I hated that thing. But now it's better for me that if you have one of those touch ones. You could look at the album cover. You know that makes a huge difference for me, and I, and I think that's getting lost with a lot a lot of folks. I think you know it sh- when it shouldn't be. You should have you should have a package. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And there's something special about when you open up a record and you look at the fucking album cover, and then you, I mean, it's like a book. You flip through it, and there's there's just information in there, lyrics. And you know, you, I was one of those kids that always looked through the thank yous and shit, and I like to see like who's hooked up with who, and you know, just shit that maybe doesn't yeah. matter to everybody, but 
I don't know. Like, I think there's a lot more people than I think that actually did that because there's a lot of people out there like us that miss that. Yeah, it's 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 going to be the people who who are around when they're when they're used to at the record stores. <laughs> <laughs> but at, at the same time, I have noticed here recently that like with the vinyls, a lot of that's coming back out, and uh, everybody's seeming to release vinyl versions. And they, I mean, they're putting together good packages. Some of the labels are, and I'm not sure how well they're selling, but. Yeah. There's always collectors. That first, that first uh, split that we made with the Lenny and Codex, I think I think Metal Coven put out uh, 500 copies. Mm-hmm. They, sold, they sold out pretty quick. Yeah. That was, that was really cool. But, you know, they every once in a while would do a colored vinyl just to get things moving or... You know, they just, they just market it in the right place. But uh, Enrico printed... I um, mean, Crystal Soap... Uh, they printed uh, 20% of the vinyl runs a yellow vinyl. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it looks pretty cool. Very pretty cool, man. Pretty psyched about that. <laughs> I think you know we've had um, that uh, that split was white and black splatter, and the uh, bloodbath LP, the double LP, was some a couple of those were red and black splatter. So, so like this is the, the third colored vinyl that we're we're getting pressed. Yeah, that stuff's pretty cool, man. Yeah, I definitely I'll save it for my kids. I'll save it for my kids, and I'll put it on eBay in twenty years. <laughs> pay for their college or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Sh- shit. Well, you never know, man. I- I've seen some that go on there for ridiculous amounts. I don't. I, yeah. I often wonder, like, is are, are they fucking kidding? You know, like, fucking thousand yeah. dollars for a fucking record? Seriously? They're just hoping somebody buys it. <laughs> you can do, uh, you can do, um, like a completed listing search on eBay to see if anybody's really grabbing money and see what people are actually paying for them. But yeah. uh, we had a we had a cassette that was released. Uh, when we were broken up and uh, Phil shipped a couple to me I think maybe 10 copies and me being the big idiot I was I was like I'll give them away and stuff and I gave them away and I had four left this was before you know our full length came out I was like I'm going to put one on eBay and see what it goes for (laughs) sold for $85 (laughs) Damn. I was, like, I was like, wow, I'm getting paid for something I did, you know, six years ago. <laughs> and it wasn't much because I'm always recording for free, but I was pretty pretty psyched about it. I was like, that made me feel good. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, that's cool, man. Yeah. Someday. Well, as of now, what what's your guys' plans for the future? Well, we play everything by ear. Pretty much, we're waiting to see how this goes. This record, this, uh, if there's demand for another one, we'll just get together and put one together. I think. And um, as far as playing out, I think if something comes on the table that's interesting enough, <clears throat> and it doesn't uh, require too much of an investment for us, as a no investment at all, uh, we'd probably throw a band together and and do something. But we're we're completely laid back and we're busy with a bunch of other things. So you know we're kind of we're kind of on the mentality of uh, take the order when it comes. Well, the music's definitely cool, man. I've enjoyed Hour of Thirteen and uh, the new record Vestal Claret's fucking has some badass shit, man. Thanks. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. Let me ask you, what's the craziest thing you guys have ever seen at a show? Either your own or, or another band that was playing? Well, we haven't played any shows together, but uh, it's hard to say, man. You know what? I'd have to say the, the craziest show I've ever went to was I saw Slayer on the Week in the Abyss tour, which was a week-long tour that they did the week before Seasons of the Abyss came out. Nice. And 
And uh, I took a bus to the show with a buddy of mine. He was a brand new buddy, too. I had just met him, and he was from the area, and I wasn't. So he, he agreed to get me to the venue. And it was a living room in Providence, Rhode Island. And the amount of bloody faces. <laughs> <laughs> it was a concrete floor in that place, man. And you know, even though they were playing songs that no one heard, <laughs> oh man, it was just, it was brutal. And I remember Dave Lombardo walking out, but he wasn't walking. He was being carried and his body was steaming. <laughs> <laughs> they brought him out after the show towards the bus, and he was just, you know, these dudes are carrying him, and he's, he was, there's just steam coming off his entire top, you know, he was playing, shirt, he was playing shirtless, of course, you know, but that, that show almost made me scared to be a metalhead. <laughs> yeah, he, he's a fucking machine, man, I mean, a Slayer show is, that's, there's no other show quite like it. Yeah. That was that was a special one, man. I, I I always would go back to that and remember it fondly. So, and I really wish I saved my shirt because that was a, a special occasion shirt because it said a week in the abyss, you know. Yeah. Like they, you know, that was only a week long tour, man. They did some shows out west and some shows out east, and then the record came out on a Tuesday because that's when all the releases are released around here. Yeah, special one. I used to work at a record store, so that was always Monday nights were always the nights to put out the new discs. Fuck yeah, man! Well, uh, dude, I guess I'm about out of questions. What What would you like to tell your fans and all the listeners out there listening? I would just say thanks. If you want to say hello, say hello. Like us on Facebook. But, you know, we're, I think we're at 664 likes, so once we get to 666, we won't be taking any more likes. So. <laughs> Just turn it <laughs> off at that point. We're going we're to we're gonna have a party. <laughs> no, man, that's, that's good. If, if you like it, and if you really like it, let us know, because we're just, we're just two guys living in Connecticut, and uh, we, we, we appreciate it if uh, people say hello. But uh, I'm just happy to be something that I wrote and recorded is, is getting released and getting publicity. And, uh, I love, I love to write music, so I'm never going to stop. No, I don't, you know, I don't know if this, this project's going to keep going. Obviously we're, we're going to do our best, but you know, just like Philly, he's always, he's always writing and singing. I, I do the same thing, but all my stuff is completely under the ground. <laughs> you know, it's not a, it's not a marketable in a bad way. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're definitely going to play the fucking shit out of this record, man. That's for sure. Oh, thanks so much, man. Yeah, no problem, yeah. dude. Well, Simon, before I let you go, um, can I get you to make us a station tag real quick? Yeah. Give me the... Uh, is, is there, is it, it's an internet radio station, right? Yeah, yeah. Just say, uh, this is Simon from Vestal Claret, and you're listening to Metal Devastation Radio. Okay, here we go. This is Simon from Vestal Claret, and you are listening to Metal Devastation Radio. Got it. All right, That's cool, That's good, me? Yeah, man. You want, it, you want me to do it in the King Diamond voice? <laughs> sure. Yeah, hell yeah, dude. I, I won't do that. I won't do that. <laughs> People think I'm silly. But I used to... Uh, <laughs> I used to make jokes with my buddies in high school. We, we used to, you know, we'd, we'd end up crashing at each other's houses. And I'd have this thing where I'd say, it's breakfast at King Diamond's house. Hello, good morning. Would you like some scrambled eggs? <laughs> <laughs> hey, King Diamond but, fucking rules, man. We love King. He's so awesome, man. I swear to God, Abigail is such the most insanely evil record ever made, man. That concept is, it could be made into a movie. Yeah. He, he, I've, I've read that he's been talking about trying to get that done. I hope he does. Somebody's got to do it, man, because it's completely evil. Yeah. Up to the point where Abigail comes out and, like, eats her mother. That, that could <laughs> happen anywhere. It, it could be eating her everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh, 